Good morning, Denver Community Church. How is everybody? Nice. Love the energy. Welcome to all of you. It's good to be together. Uh, my name is John Gettings. I'm our executive pastor. And uh, it's always a gift to be together, to gather on Sundays, to explore and participate in the life of Jesus so that we can be a healing presence in the world. Uh, now, you probably have heard from us too much in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been inviting you to give financially as we came to the end of our fiscal year, kind of our accounting year, which ended on June 30th. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, obviously, as a, as a church, as a nonprofit, these are things we get to do, we have to do. Um, but it always amazes us how generous you all are. So we were able to meet our goals for June to kind of go beyond that, to continue to fund all the things. Round of applause. So thank you. Uh, whether you gave a small gift or a large gift, all of those come together to help fund what we get to do as a faith community. And those are things like gather together on Sundays, have opportunities to build community. All the 44 partners that we have locally and internationally, we get to help uh, give gifts to them all because of your generosity. So thank you sincerely for investing yourself that way. And, uh, and then this morning, I just want to invite you to even greater participation in the life of our community. So maybe you're coming in this morning and you're wanting to build relationships. You're wanting to have spiritual partnerships of people that can invite and challenge you in your faith. Let us know about that. We want to be able to try to help connect you. Uh, maybe you're coming in and you want to meet some new people, but also serve. We have lots of opportunities to do that, one of which is in DCC Kids. Uh, we need 37 more folks to help get on the roster for this fall to help watch our littles, help teach uh, some of the older kids, and it's a gift to invest in the next generation in that way. So uh, if you're interested, you can let us know about that. There are a couple of other spots that are available. Hannah's alone on the platform, so maybe you're a musician and you want to jump in and help serve on our worship team. We'd love to have you do that as well. So lots of ways to do that. Maybe it's pursue some of the opportunities through Project Renew, uh, which is our justice and peacemaking initiative uh, that helps support those 44 local and international partners. All of these are ways to get involved. All of these are things that we, again, get to do as a faith community that we're feeling called to. And we want you to fully participate in the life of the community. Be involved in all of these ways. So uh, step in. If you have any questions about that, you can do a couple of things. One, check out all of these opportunities on our website, on our app. There's a card in that seat pocket in front of you that you can fill out. We'll get in touch with you this week with some of those. Or a few of us will be back in the participate area after this gathering. Would love to be able to uh, talk with you about all of those. Um, so let us know. Help us help you take some of those steps of investments and participation and involvement in the life of our community. And then uh, if you do put anything in an envelope or fill out a card, make sure you drop those in the silver gift boxes on that back wall on your way out, okay? Well, are we ready for worship? Would you stand now? We're going to enter into worship together. Thanks so much for being here. It's great to be together. My name is Amanda Lum. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I'm excited this morning because I get to introduce our first guest teacher in our season of teaching where we invite some of our friends from across the city to come and teach on Sundays. We do this every summer, um, and it's really because we value hearing from many different voices, learning with and from um, friends in the city. And when, when you're a part of a church, you don't get to go to a bunch of other places and hear from different voices. So this is a time and a space for us to hear from some friends um, across the city, even across the country who come in, and we get to hear from them about how God is moving and working in their lives what they're learning, how they're growing. And we get to learn from them and with them, and we get to um, hear from them and, and continue to journey alongside them. So I'm grateful this morning that I get the chance to introduce you, our first guest teacher for the summer, um, Michelle. She's here with us this morning. She's one of the pastors on staff um, at Westside Church, and she's a new friend to me. I just met her, and so I'm really excited, have been looking forward to hearing her teaching since I knew that she was going to be coming in. So please, will you help me welcome Michelle to the platform this morning? Thank you. Good morning, Denver Community Church. How are you doing? Good? I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm very excited to be here this morning to get to know everyone. I was mentioning earlier to Amanda, this is such a welcoming place, um, such beautiful worship as well, and uh, I'm excited to be here. My name is Michelle Casas. My full name, I'm Latina, so... Brace yourselves. 
My full name is Lily Michelle Casas Machicao, because you won't remember any of that. You can just call me Misha, all right? Um, just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, I think I, I have a picture of me and my family. This is the last time I was there. This is 2019. I have two older brothers, my parents, and dozens and dozens of family members um, after that. And we... Um, Funny fact about where I come from, it's not the jungle, as a lot of people think, like, you must come from a very warm place because it's Latin America. I come from a 14er. Our city is the highest capital in the world. So although we look very happy here, don't be fooled because we are struggling to breathe. <laughs> and I moved in 2017 after God brought me here, talking about God on the move, uh, he brought me to the U.S. in a miraculous way to get my master's at Denver Seminary. I met my wonderful husband who's here today, got married in 2020. Um, I, I uploaded, thank you, thank you. I uploaded uh, this picture because I wasn't sure he was going to make it. Uh, our car broke this morning, so he had to Uber here, but he made it. That's the latest picture that we have. Um, and yeah, I'm just very excited to be here. I'm excited to start the sermon series. And uh, I want you to know that I take this seriously. So I always, my first step to prepare a sermon, it's always to go for a long walk where I put either worship music or I, no music at all. And I'm just asking God the whole time, Lord, what is it that you want to speak to us? What is it that you want to talk to your people? I'm just a vessel, but you are the one that is going to speak that day. So what would you like to talk about? And I'm thinking about, all right, on the move. Okay, so maybe I can think about examples of where I've seen God on the move. And trust me, uh, by God's grace and mercy, I've seen him on the move in my life in miraculous ways and around me as well. So many times that it'll be hard to put in a 30-minute sermon. So I'm thinking, all right, maybe I can start my sermon series with, do I see God moving? Do I think God is moving? And immediately the answer in my mind is like, duh, yes, he's moving. So I'm like, all right, that takes about 10 seconds of my sermon. I still need to figure out 29 minutes and 50 seconds, right? So I'm like, okay, maybe the next question is, um, if God is on the move, where is he moving? Like, what are the specific areas that I can let people know? You know, I see God moving here. I see God moving here. And then immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, he's moving everywhere. He's the initiator of all things. He started everything, heaven and earth. So if everything uh, was subjected to the fall, to sin, then everything needs to be restored, right? Everything's going to be uh, done again. And because of that, God is everywhere, right? So where is God moving? He's moving in every, every single space of society, of this world, of our lives, right? And then I think that takes about other 10 seconds to say it. So check, and now I have 29 minutes and 40 seconds, right? So... I, I have been able to evidence God in such a tangible way in my life, how he moves, how he is moving right now. I do think this is a pivotal moment in history, and I think he is moving. And he's done great things that, again, I can talk to you about, from the fact that he brought me all the way from Bolivia with $20 in my pocket, not having been accepted to Denver Seminary yet, not having the means to pay for a four or a three and a half year program. And he just opened every single door to the latest thing that I saw him move miraculously in my life is this past November, uh, because of, of uh, my status here, I'm on a religious workers visa, but although I had submitted my paperwork, it was taking four times the average because of COVID. So I was in this period of time where I didn't have any status. I was just kind of waiting for my status. And then I get appendicitis. And you know with appendicitis, the only way to heal it is for them to perform surgery on you. You cannot wait. You cannot say, you know, like, I'll come back in a couple of days. You can't do that. So I got surgery without insurance because I'm in this period of time where I cannot do anything but wait in the country, right? And my bill comes back with $114,000 from my appendectomy. 
And I am, as a foreigner, uh, in my current status, I cannot, I do not want to receive any government help because that would jeopardize my process. I cannot receive any help from the government. So other, and I'm not allowed to take on loans. There's a lot of restrictions for me to take loans as a foreigner. So I'm like, what do I do now? Like, God, this seems impossible, right? And immediately I hear God saying, as I'm about to pass out, to be honest, in the financial office of the hospital, him saying, I'm still th- sitting on my throne. $114,000 does not remove me. It's not such a high uh, price to pay that it does remove me. It's a little too far for my grace, for my power. I'm still sitting on my throne. That this did not remove me. And, you know, this, this is kind of like a long story that had a lot of stuff in the middle. But, um, by his grace, the hospital decided to completely forgive my debt, um, uh, in like the next five months. And I am now debt free. Thank God. Talking about God being on the move. He is moving. He's still performing miracles around us, in us, through us. And, um, he, you know, he shows up. He shows up. He doesn't stop. He's the initiator of all things and he is moving everywhere. But I do believe something with all my heart this morning. And this is where I want to go today. And it is that there is a substantial difference between knowing God is on the move and witnessing and participating God on the move. You know, we join every Sunday. You guys probably join your small groups and learn about God, what he did in the Bible, what he's doing through other people's lives as part of their testimonies and everything. And we get to hear a lot and to know, like, what is what is God doing? You know, uh, if we read Exodus, we're like, did he take them out of Egypt successfully? And we're like, oh, yeah, it is right there. They actually did make it to the promised land. Like, we know we have the knowledge that God is moving. But today I want to challenge us to join him in the movement to join God in the move because God on the move equals us on the move as part of God's followers Christ followers believers Christ disciples we cannot sit down and just see God moving and not join him right amen we get to join God in the movement and I see an example with, with Job, you know that he, he went through a lot. That man went through a lot. He, he lived a righteous life. He tried his best. He, you know, honored God, worshiped God with everything he had. You know, there was no one more just than him, uh, in the entire earth and bad things happened to him. And although that had happened, although he had lived a life trying to honor God and to love God, he reaches a point where he says, My ears had heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. And I think this is a substantial difference between knowing, oh yeah, God, yeah. I mean, I know who God is. Yes, I hear about him all the time, you know, in my Bible, in my Bible studies, at the church, by friends. Since I'm little, I know who God is. But I want to ask you, do you experience God on the move? Do you dare to jump in the movement that he's he's in right now that's what i want us to to that is what i how i want to challenge us today to leave this building and to start thinking yeah my eyes had heard you lord my eyes had heard of what you're doing in denver my eyes had heard what you're doing in in school my eyes had heard about what you're doing among our jobs about about among our families among our children but now You know, my eyes can see you, Lord. God is moving. But when we talk about God on the move, we don't want just want to know God is on the move. We want to join him. So I have four bullet points that I think are important for us to jump, to, to, to uh, motivate us, to excite us about moving, to, uh, to jump into God's movement. Okay. Number one is that if God is in fact moving, right? We got that checked. Is God moving? Yes. Okay. So if God is in fact moving, it is our job to find out where he's moving and join him. If God is moving, it is our job to find out where he's moving and join him. One character in the Bible that I think it's very good at teaching is this is Moses. 
he, uh, this guy really jumped into the movement of God. You know, um, you know that he was chosen by God to liberate the Israelites from the oppression, the economic, financial, religious, emotional oppression that they were going through in Egypt. And he's chosen by God. And what does God tell him? Moses, you're so prepared. You're so prepared. You're so wonderful that now I'm going to use you to liberate the people because you're just like such an example for everyone else. So I'm going to use you. No, right? The story goes pretty much like, hey, Moses, I want to use you. Oh, God, uh, I'm not really ready. I'm not really the best, you know, which is kind of what you and I usually answer to God whenever there's something going on that we know God is moving. And our first answer, when we hear God saying, are you going to join this? Are you going to fight for the equality of people? Are you going to fight for justice? Are you going to join to help the most oppressed, the most marginalized in our society? Our first thought is, I'm not ready. Oh, no, no, I'm not the best one. I still have so many things. And this is what Moses' answer. God comes and he says, hey, I'm going to use you. Oh, no, 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 God, I'm not ready. Uh, yeah, I never ask you if you were ready. I just ask you if you're in or not. And then Moses says, okay, God, I'm in. And he's such a good example. There's such a distinct difference between him and the rest of Isra- the Israelites. There's such a huge difference. The other Israelites, what did they do? They complain the whole time. They actually would rather go back to their old ways than to join God's movement among them, right? They start saying, Egypt was the best. No, it wasn't. You were pretty much oppressed. It was not the best. And many of us, many of us would rather jump out of God's move than to wrestle with the difficulty of being inside God's movement. Sometimes it's so hard to be in God's move because the person next to you doesn't think the same way that you do, because there's obstacles, because it's not easy, and we think, this is too much, I need to jump out. And a lot of us act like the Israelites, saying, it's better to go back the old ways, it's better to just leave everything untouched and not say anything because it's more comfortable, and it's not. And we act like the Israelites a lot of the time. I think in the U.S. we have it so good, guys. I think we have such a such a good place to be. And I'm a foreigner here, but just because my two feet are standing in American soil, I know I'm more privileged than 80% of the world. I have more resources than 80% of the world. I have more freedom. I have more access to things that people can only dream of. And we have so many resources here in the U.S. And I've seen so much faith among people here in the U.S. But unfortunately, just as any other place in the world, I don't always see this faith being followed by actions. And that is when the, where the key is, to move from the knowledge of God Almighty to join the God Almighty. Did you know that today you have the chance to join the God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth in what he is doing? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You do not want to be audience. You do not want to act like audience where God is actually moving as the main character of this movement. Moses, unfortunately, has to witness that with his generation, and he has to wait for an entire generation to pass away for this new generation to come up and actually believe in God's move. We do not want to be that generation that didn't believe, do we? We want to be the generation that believes in God and says, I see you moving in the city. I see you moving in the government. I see you moving among churches. I see you moving among the poor. I see you moving in the world. I want to join you. I want to believe you. I don't want to put excuses and say the old ways are better. And how do we do this? How do we join God? It's by following his presence. Again, Moses had had it all together in this, in this sense. Exodus 33, verse 15, he says, If your presence does not go with us, Moses replied, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that your people and I have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? How else will it be distinguished from all other people on the face of the earth? 
if you do not come with us. What Moses is basically saying is like, aren't we supposed to be light and salt here? Aren't we supposed to be the witness to all nations about this God Almighty? How do we do this? By following God's presence. Sometimes, I think as Christ followers, we join a movement, but it's not necessarily a movement where God is. And trust me, it could be a good movement, but God is not initiating it. He's not asking us to join there. I want to ask you, and of course you don't have to answer this out loud, but how, how many times do you wake up and, and think, God, good morning. How can I join you today? What are you up to today, Lord? What are you doing today that I can join you in? Where are you moving, Lord? What are we doing today, Holy Spirit? Where is your presence going, Lord? Because, you know, if I'm going to be fighting for this thing in my job that I think is the right thing to do, but if your presence is not there, Lord, I don't want to do that. But if your presence is there, Lord, I want to join you wherever you are. So again, number one, if God is in fact moving, it is our job to join him. It is our job to find out where he is moving and then join him. Not ask him to join what our agenda, not ask him to, to join our movement, our personal matters, but to join him. Here I am, you know, I'm here to serve you, not the other way. Number two. We could be participants of God's movement. Yes, let's say, okay, step number one. Is God moving? All right. Step number two, if he's moving, it's our job to join him, right? Step number three in that, we could be participants of God's movement. We could be in the movement, but we could be in the audience of that movement. Look at Israel in the story of Exodus. God could have not been more evident that he was in the middle of something, that he was on the move among them. It could have not been more evident with all the miracles, the cloud, the pillar of fire. It could have not been more evident. What did the Israelites do? Grabbed a bag of popcorn, started looking from the audience. Hey, do you see that pillar? Yeah, yeah, I wonder what it is. And Moses, like, I already told you, it's God's presence. Hey, the, you know, the, the promised land is over there, you know, it is, is that it? Moses, like, I already told you that there's where we've been going this whole time. The spies, right? Oh, the people there are so big. They see us as grasshoppers. It is impossible. Moses, like, I've already told you, it is God's presence that's among us that's going to bring us there. It is not about you. But what did they do? They started being audience. Fast forward to Jesus' time. Same thing happened. I wonder how many people saw Jesus healing. How many people saw Jesus driving demons away? How many people heard the Sermon of the Mount? How many people, well, the 5,000 with the, with the miracle of the fish and the, and the, um, and the loaves of bread. How many people were there among the presence, about, among Jesus' movement, but not all of them were there following Jesus. They were just audience. A lot of people there were just the crowd. Are we the crowd or are we disciples? Are we the crowd or are we disciples? There's a substantial difference. You could say like, oh, did you, did you hear Jesus did that? Yes, I was there. I saw it. Yeah. Oh, did you hear that Jesus did that? Yes, yes. I already know all the gossip. Yes, my Latin Jewish friend told me about it. <laughs> yes, I know, I know all of, uh, all about that. Yes, I, I knew before it was on the news. Yes, I know that. Do you believe though? Do you follow? Are you a true disciple? Are you just part of the crowd? I think Jesus came to start a movement that we get to participate in today. That we get to witness today and that we get the privilege to join, again, the Lord Almighty 
in what he's doing. Isn't that a privilege, guys? Isn't that a privilege to say, Lord, what do you, what do you want for schools in the U.S.? Lord, what do you want for families in the U.S.? Lord, what do you want for our government in the U.S.? How can I join you, Lord? Guide me, Holy Spirit. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and he came into a synagogue in Nazareth and he opens the scroll of Isaiah to what I believe is his manifesto, essentially. He's starting something right there. He opens the scroll and he reads the scripture. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Other versions say to proclaim the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was this huge event um, among the Israelites where that God had established that it was the seven times the year of seven. So 49 years after year 50, there was the year of Jubilee where everyone that was captive was set, uh, set free that the land, if it was, if it was sold to someone else, it needed to be recovered back to its original clan and family where uh, if anyone was, um, a slave, they could, they could be free on that year. It was essentially a reset button. And Jesus is saying, I have come to proclaim the year of the Jubilee. And this is what we get to join since then. We are here to, placa- to proclaim the year of the Jubilee. But check if, check this out. If Jesus himself started by saying, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Do you not think that you need the Spirit of the Lord for what He has for you? Sometimes we think that we don't. We won't say it, but we don't ask the Spirit of the Lord to be on us for what He has for us. And I think if Jesus Himself asked for the Holy Spirit to be on Him and said, He's on me because He has anointed me to do this, then if we want to do X, Y, and Z, we need the Spirit of the Lord to anoint us, to be on us. Amen? Second thing, he says, yeah, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. To do what? To preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty, to release the oppressed, the recovery of sight, all of these equity, justice-related things that we get to join once we ask the Holy Spirit. Did you know, I mean, I come from a third world country, so... I, I've evidenced this so well for 27 years of my life before moving to the U.S. Did you know that there's actually enough food in this world so no one has to be malnourished? No one has to die of starvation. There, there, it's not that there isn't enough food in the world that, yeah, some people get it, some people don't. There is actually enough food for everyone to eat in this world. The problem is that some of us are using more of the food. Some areas of the world are using more food than they, they actually need. So other areas do not have enough. And this is just an example. Again, I believe the U.S., it's a key place in the world because this country is a leader. And if we talk about God being on the move, I think the U.S. is a key country. Not that it's better, not that it's more important. I just think it's a key country in the world. But that being said, don't believe that this country is indispensable. The only thing that's indispensable for God's movement, it's God. And again, just like the Israelites had to let go of a complete generation for God to say, all right, you guys didn't want to. All right, guys, you didn't want to join. You didn't want to believe. You wanted to be spectators. You wanted to be crowd. You wanted to be audience. All right, I'm going to have to wait for the next generation that will believe. So don't think that this country is indispensable. Don't think that you're... Your generation's indispensable. Only God is indispensable for God's movement. We could be participants of God's movement from the audience section. Number three, God's movement requires 
all of you. God's movement requires all of you. Never in the history of the world has people been so busy that there's no time for God (laughs) in our agenda. Some of the things that I've seen here, I'm like, come on, you know. I mean, my country is an extreme because you could literally be like in the middle of a random day and call people and be like, hey, do you want to grab something? They're like, yeah, see you in 10 minutes in this place. Perfect. You know, like everyone's available at all times. And here I've experienced the complete opposite. Like, you know, there's times that I'm like, hey, you know, I'm actually not doing great. Or like, hey, I have really big news. You know, I just want to meet with you. Like, and I can call or text a good friend. And they're like, awesome. Yes, tell me all about it. My next available time, it's like August 13 from 4.30 to 5.30. But I actually need to be somewhere else at 5.30. So how about 5.20-ish? And I'm like, by then, I'm not even going to remember what I was going through, whether it was happy or sad. People are so busy, and sometimes, sometimes it is the religious agenda as well that keeps us really busy. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? Sometimes we are the religious leader that is too busy with the church agenda that we do not have time to meet justice issues, equity issues. Sometimes... We do that as well. And the movement of God requires all of us. You know, Moses didn't tell God, okay, God, yes, you said you don't really need my ability. You only need yourself and you just need me to obey you. Great. So, you know, Egypt and the desert are not actually that far away. So how about I spend four days in the desert, three days back in Egypt, you know, we can do weekends, I can be like flexible hours, I can do three tens, and then, you know, no, he doesn't say that. He says, okay, God, if you've called me, I'll go. I'll let let go of everything, and I'll follow you. In the desert? Okay, in the desert. Where there's no water, food, evident (laughs) on human eyes? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes God's movement seems like this dry, deserty field where we're like, if I join that, it's going to get really bad really fast. And it's going to be dry. It's going to (laughs) be, you know, I'm going to be hungry. I'm going to be thirsty. And God says, but are you going to join me? He doesn't want part of us. He doesn't want half of us. He doesn't want us on the weekend. He doesn't want us just on Sunday morning. He wants all of us. So you may think, okay, do we all become, you know, those free spirits that quit our jobs and don't have kids and abandon our wives to follow God's move? Because that's, it seems like you're asking me not to have a life. No. I mean, it is, it is exactly in the middle, in the midst of your life, of wherever you are. If you're a father, your kids are part of your movement. If you're a, a husband, if you're a wife, your wife and your husband, your spouse, it's part of your movement. If you're a teacher, your classroom is part of your movement. If you're a pastor, definitely your church is part of your movement. It is in the midst of that. Let's not compare to, com- compartmentalize let's not do that it is in the midst of that it all of you means all of what you have already in your plate sometimes when we say all of you it's like i cannot fit anything else in my agenda no it's everything that you already have on your plate that's where your movement is and yes it is messy and yes there will be difference of opinions in the u.s really I didn't think, I didn't see that coming. Yes, there will be difference of opinions. And sometimes our political party comes in second place. Sometimes our affiliation comes in second place. Sometimes our thoughts and our beliefs come in second place because God's gospel, his movement comes first. Not that the other things are not important or not existent, but they all are submitted to God's movement. And there will be differences. Check the people that Jesus picked for the movement he started. A zealot 
with a tax collector, with a trader, <laughs> with, it's like, what? Who would think of put all these people together? And Peter, that's just annoying to me, the whole gospel. Like, he just thinks he's better and he's not. And it's like, you mix all of those. You're like, no, this is, this is the worst people to work together towards a movement. And Jesus proved us wrong. He proved that we do not need to be in the exact page of what we think or how we want to come about, but we do need to submit all those things if we want his kingdom to come and his will to be done on heaven as it is, on earth as it is in heaven, right? So it is in spite of our differences that we get to preach the good news to the poor, to give freedom to the oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. So God's movement requires all of you. Number four, God's move sometimes means full stop. And this sounds like it's against everything I'm saying, right? If you're moving, then you're not stopping. If you're stopping, then you're not moving, right? Tell that to Paul that had to be sitting blind for three days until he got to move. Tell that to Joseph that had to wait in prison for years while God was already on the move. Tell that to David that for years after his anointing as the new king had to wait and still be the shepherd, the little brother, not so loved, not God, not daddy's favorite shepherd. While God was already on the move, he had, a, he already had a calling. He already was promised by God that he would be the king, but he was on a full stop. Sometimes the full stop doesn't mean God's not on the move. And some of us think, okay, this sounds so poetic. This sounds so pretty, but you don't know where I am. I have experienced so much loss. I've experienced so much pain. I've experienced so much suffering. You cannot ask me to move. God's already moving. Even if you're in full stop, he's already moving. Because it was never about you and your ability to move. And it's all about him and his Holy Spirit already moving. Before coming to the U.S., I had a surgery that was supposed to leave me healing for like six weeks and in six weeks I was supposed to be back in the game and I had a trip I needed to go to India I was going to be uh the Bolivian representative in this missionary trip in India I already had the tickets purchased I already had the trip I already had the itinerary and everything and every single thing that could have gone wrong in my surgery went wrong to the point of I almost got both feet amputated because of a really bad infection so instead of six weeks, it happened three and a half months later that I could barely stand up and I had to learn how to walk because I didn't even remember how to stand up after that long time just laying in bed. And I had to learn how to stand up. I had to learn how to walk again like a baby. And of course, I lost my trip. I lost all the money I needed. I felt really convicted to give back the money to the person that had trusted me with the money to go to this mission trip and um, at the time, I don't know why I didn't think of explaining that why it didn't happen. So I just worked really hard to give that money back. And I started to grow bitterness in my heart, thinking, Lord, I thought you had provided this money. I thought you had provided this group. I thought you had provided my gifts and everything for me to be ready, my theological preparation, for me to be ready to go to this mission trip. And it seems like you just showed me a chocolate and when I was about to grab it, you just pulled it back. Years later, I'm so thankful for that season in my life because it taught me about God's sovereignty and it taught me a really healthy and necessary fear to God. Sometimes we're in, it's like a race, the Formula One, is that what it's called? And, you know, the, the, the checkpoint part where we need to get our tires fixed, our oil change is as necessary to win the race as you actually being on the, on the race itself, accelerating. Those moments are necessary. And if today you're feeling stuck, I want to tell you it is not over. 
It is not over. God is on the move. Whether you, you feel stuck right now, that did not stop God from being on the move. I want to invite the worship team back here, please. I want us to think about fighting for the promises that God has given us. Because sometimes the move that he's willing and he's called you to do is not the same move that he's called me to. And I cannot, I cannot join God in, in what he has called you necessarily. In many things I can, but in some things it's your own move with God that he has chosen you. It's like Jacob, I feel like. He's known as the deceiver, you know, his grandfather received the promise that, you know, through him, all nations will be blessed. And long story short, we see his grandchild, Jacob, being the deceiver. He's not following the promise of God. And he has to fight all night until daybreak for his blessing. Sometimes we need to be like Jacob. If we're stuck right now, if we think that God is not really moving that he's not really showing us where to move, how to do it. We just need to fight all night for a blessing and say, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let go until you bless me, Lord. God's move sometimes means a full stop. And this is a race, church. This is a race that we've been invited to that you didn't start. It started generations before. Jesus himself started this. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off of everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us throw off of everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It is not about you. You know the best news you'll hear today? God's move is not about you, but it requires all of you. What? Yeah, God's move is not about you. It's not about me. It is all about Him. But He, in His mercy, requires you to join Him. And He's modeled this for us, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You don't even get to run this race blindfold because He ran it before you. You just need to fix your eyes to Him. So I want to encourage you today. If you would like to stand up, I would love to pray. And you can, you can join me in the prayer if you want. I want to I wanna encourage you to dare to ask God today. God, where are you moving? Lord, what's the specific area that you are moving that I can join you today? That you're calling us collectively? That you're calling us as a church? That you're calling us as a body? That you're calling my small group? That you're calling my family? That you're calling me in my job? You might be calling me individually, Lord. Where can I join you, Lord? Holy Spirit, where are you? Where can I join you today? What are those areas in society, in our city, in our world that I can join you today? For some of us, the world might, the, uh, God might be talking about pick up your stuff and you're moving to the other side of the world or the continent. For some of us, is hey, your movement is your kid right now because I'll use them. Ask God, ask God, Lord, how can me? And my spouse honor you. How can we join the movement that you have for us? Dare to ask him. Because God is moving. I've been asked this many times about the church where I am and the location where it is like, do you see God moving? I'm like, oh yeah, I do. But there's so much poverty. There's so many immigrants. There's so much going on, so much violence there. And I'm like, but I see him moving. Big time. Dare to have faith and to join God in that. And it is my prayer today 
Denver Community Church that you would leave this building understanding a little bit more of Job's um, comment saying, my ears had heard you, Lord, but now my eyes see you. So Holy Spirit, would you please pour yourself down here, Lord, anointed us for the calling that you have for each of us, for the calling that you have for Denver Community Church, for the calling that you have for each small group, for each family, for each individual at this place, Lord. Would you start equipping us, Lord, whether it is that we need to start taking steps or we need to acknowledge that we're on a full stop right now. Lord, you never stop. Help us join our society. Help us join our city. Help us join this country. Help us join the world, Lord, to bring the good news to the poor, to set the oppressed free, to give sight to the blind, to declare the year of Jubilee.